it's Thursday, it's nine o'clock. I'm Joanna Gosling. Welcome to the programme. The police watchdog has warned of a real possibility that Brexit will trigger a spike in hate crimes. It says victims across England and Wales are being let down by police. We did find that there was an inconsistent and patchy picture across the country. One in ten girls in the UK are unable to afford sanitary products. Campaigners say having a period is leading to financial stress. If it's winter, you use your socks, gloves, hat, anything, tissue. If it's the summer, socks, anything. You don't rely on anyone else because you can't. Plus, worries that pupil referral units cannot attract the right staff, leading to concerns about the education of the most vulnerable of children. Good morning. Welcome to the programme. We're live until 11 this morning. As you'd expect, we'll keep you across all the latest breaking and developing stories. And do get in touch, as ever, on everything we're talking about this morning. We're particularly interested to hear your thoughts on a warning that police need to do more to combat hate crime. A major review in England and Wales has found victims have been let down after being targeted because of personal characteristics such as race, religion or sexual orientation. Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary found that in nearly half of the cases it examined, the response wasn't good enough. Some cases recorded on police systems were given a hate crime flag without any apparent justification, while others weren't flagged when they should have been. We're interested to hear your thoughts. Have you been a victim of hate crime? How did you feel you were treated? Do get in touch. Remember the hashtag Victoria Live. And if you're emailing and are happy for us to contact you and maybe to want to be part of our discussions on the show, please do include your phone number in your message. If you text, you'll be charged at the standard network rate. Our main news today, the new Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab will meet the EU's chief negotiator in Brussels for the first time since his appointment. His visit comes as the European Commission is warning countries across the EU to prepare for the possibility of a no-deal Brexit. They say there could be serious consequences for governments, travellers and businesses if no agreement is reached. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister is visiting the Irish border today to reassure residents and businesses of the government's commitment to maintain free movement. Well, let's get the very latest now from Chris Mason in Westminster. Chris, we've been focused on all of the drama and difficulties here, but a reminder today from the EU, the clock is ticking. Yeah, absolutely. And this document to be published in just a couple of hours' time from the European Union, setting out its advice to the remaining 27 member states about how they should approach a no-deal scenario. Now, you speak to people in government here and they say they welcome that document and that they hope that it includes mitigations for dealing with no deal rather than uh, what some might see as a very doom-laden negative situation. As far as the UK government is concerned, uh, they are making the argument more vociferously than ever that preparations are underway for no deal as well, although the Prime Minister has emphasised that she doesn't think it's any more likely uh, than it's ever been. But there are going to be some documents published uh, over the summer so that uh, individuals and businesses can prepare for the consequences of no deal. The vast majority of people here at Westminster think no deal is absolutely worth avoiding at all costs. There are one or two who say that the UK could positively embrace it, but not many, including amongst uh, the Brexiteers. Meanwhile, for Dominic Raab, Imagine being in his shoes this morning. You've made it to the Cabinet, a political career achievement reached, and yet you've got to go before the Commons in the next half hour, then go out to Brussels to meet Michel Barnier for the first time just months before Brexit uh, is due to happen. They're going to have a full meeting uh, this afternoon and then a getting-to-know-you dinner uh, this evening. It's kind of Brexit speed dating for a guy who's only just arrived in the Cabinet and has got one heck of a job. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, let's go to Gavin Lee in Brussels. Give us more, Gavin, on the perspective from there. Well, given that they are sending out the European Commission the, the idea of this preparedness card. So basically, this is 15 pages. We've seen a draft of this document for all EU member states, the other, the other 27 that are staying in the European Union. It's a brace yourself. Here's the emergency landing card, uh, because if it's going to get us what Alex Ferguson, the old Man United manager, once called squeaky bum time, that's when it potentially can get difficult. You know, they're running out of superlatives here at the European Union. They've said the clock is ticking. This is now the warning to all the other 27 countries to say a how-to guide. 
in case it comes to leaving the EU for Britain with no agreement. Now, within it is quite specific details about uh, plane landings, for example, passenger records, suddenly the UK being disconnected from that, having to prepare customs officials as well. And one, point, one notice they make clear is if there's no agreement with Brexit and it's World Trade Organization rules, then suddenly lorries at borders will be problematic, queuing at you know, Calais and, and on the, the UK side of the border as well. So the Irish today have said, for example, they are bringing forward uh, and employing a thousand extra customs officials to cope with that. And they go through detail of medicines, for example, that shouldn't be tested anymore in the UK and problems with um, the Galileo system, the science system, the satellite system that uh, Britain has invested heavily in, that the EU are clear that will have to come out of the UK, the centre for that. So all of these areas, the Austrians, the Dutch, the Irish, uh, they are seen as examples of best in show for all of this because they are highlighted. They have websites, for example, particularly in Holland, where if you are a small or medium business, put in your details and it will tell you exa what, exactly what areas that you need to start thinking about. And Joanna, I think it comes down to those businesses, listening to the Business Association today, saying that only about a third of businesses are starting to prepare contingency plans. And this comes briefly on the day that Dominic Robb uh, comes here to Brussels as the new Brexit Secretary meeting Michel Barnier. Coincidence that both things are happening on the same day? Well, you might very well say that. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's catch up with the rest of the news with Anita McVeigh in the newsroom. Hi, Anita. Hi, Joanna. Thank you very much. Good morning. The Press Association says detectives believe they have identified the suspected perpetrators of the Novichok attack on the Russian former spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter. The pair were targeted with the nerve agent in March of this year but have since recovered. Meanwhile, an inquest will be opened this morning into the death of Dawn Sturgis, who was exposed to Novichok in Wiltshire last month. The police watchdog has warned of a real possibility that Brexit will trigger a spike in hate crimes and said forces must take action to tackle significant problems in the way offences are dealt with at the moment. In a review of hate crimes, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary found inadequate responses in 89 of 180 cases it looked at. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Danny Shaw. Hate crime comes in different forms. Anti-Semitic graffiti, like this, an arson attack on a garden shed owned by Polish people and white powder sent to a mosque. Police guidance says hate crime should be treated as a priority. Officers are meant to attend victims within an hour of an allegation being reported. But the Inspectorate of Constabulary found the police response is patchy and in many cases not good enough. The report found too many hate crimes were wrongly recorded. It took police an average of five days to visit victims in 40% of cases it looked at. And there were no visits to hate crime victims in over a third of the 180 cases examined in detail. It's important for victims of hate crime to be asked why it is that they think they've been victimised so that it's identified from the outset because if it is identified it can then and it should then be flagged and that in turn determines what service they receive. Two years ago there was a spike in hate crimes reported to police after the EU referendum. The inspectorate warns forces to prepare for a similar increase when Britain formally leaves the EU next March. The College of Policing says in light of the report, it's reviewing the training and guidance for officers on hate crime. Danny Shaw, BBC News. Eight people, including two who died, have been recognised by the Queen for their bravery during last year's London Bridge terror attack. Three of them are to receive the George Medal, which is awarded for gallantry. Eight people were killed last June when Borough Market and London Bridge were targeted by attackers. Donald Trump has now said that he holds Vladimir Putin personally responsible for Russian interference in the 2016 US election. At a press conference on Monday, President Trump seemed to put Russia's denials above the unanimous conclusion of US intelligence agencies. He since said he misspoke, suggesting no other US president has ever been tougher on Russia. The Israeli parliament has passed a law declaring that only Jews have the right of self-determination in the country. The nation-state law downgrades Arabic as an official language and says Jewish settlements are in the national interest. 
The Turkish government has ended the nationwide state of emergency that was imposed two years ago following a failed coup attempt, according to state media. Since 2016, tens of thousands of people have been arrested or dismissed from their jobs. The decision not to extend it for an eighth time comes weeks after President Erdogan was re-elected. The huge wildfire near Saddleworth Moor is finally out more than three weeks after the blaze started. Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service says it has now withdrawn all firefighters from the blaze, which started on the 24th of June. The fire service say much-needed showers in the last few days have helped finally bring an end to the incident. The hosepipe ban imposed across Northern Ireland is set to be lifted at noon today, just as millions of people in England are facing the first of the summer. Water companies in Northern Ireland said there'd been a fantastic response from the public to its appeals to conserve water, adding that water treatment works were now coping comfortably with demand. In northwest England, a temporary ban by United Utilities will affect 7 million people uh, from the 5th of August. It's been a record year for British book sales, according to new figures. Sales of printed books have risen for the third year in a row, while sales of digital e-books fell. Lisa Mazimba reports. Jamie Oliver's bestseller, 2017's most popular book. It helped the British publishing industry to achieve a record-breaking year. Sales of printed books were up, with hardback fiction in particular seeing a big rise of almost a third thanks in part to new thrillers from authors like Dan Brown, Lee Child and Sherry Le Pena. Readers fundamentally still value the printed word. Um, uh, publishers have invested a huge amount of um, time, effort and resource into making sure that books are still really attractive, uh, that people want to buy them uh, and also obviously they, they lend themselves very much to giving gifts as well. It's the third year in a row that physical book sales have increased, while over the same period digital book sales have decreased, demonstrating that, for the time being, fears from some that e-books might soon replace traditional books appear to be unfounded. The income from audiobooks rose by 25%, but the biggest contributor to the latest record-breaking figures is international trade. Most of the British publishing industry's income, some 60%, comes from overseas. Physical book sales to Australasia are up by 14%, while sales to the rest of Europe, the industry's biggest market, have increased to a figure approaching half a billion pounds. Lisa Mazimba, BBC News. Yeah, nothing beats picking up an actual book, in my opinion. Uh, that's a summary of the news this morning. More at half past nine. Joanna. Thank you very much, Anita. See you later. Uh, a little bit later, we're going to be talking about new guidance for schools for teaching four-year-olds about mental health issues. The guidance is going to be brought in from 2020. What do you think about that? Do you think four-year-olds should be taught about mental health? Would you recognise the signs of mental health in young kids? Let us know your thoughts, all the usual ways of getting in touch. And remember, hashtag Victoria live and text will be charged at the standard network rate right now let's catch up with the sport Chris Mitchell is at the BBC Sports Centre good morning Chris good morning the open championships underway how are the early starters getting on well the early starters are enjoying some fabulous weather not a breath of wind at Carnoustie the Sun is shining the fairways are baked and the greens are nice and soft and slow so the early starters well, they should be doing well. Let's take a quick look at the leaderboard. Remember, there are lots of golfers yet to go out. So these are the early ones. Eric Van Royen. Uh, no, no complaints if you've never heard of him before. He's a little-known golfer from South Africa, three under par. But look at Danny Willett. Started with a bogey, one over par on the first hole, but he's two under. He's had a terrible time since he won the Masters a few years ago with injury and fighting to get his game back, but he's made a good start too. Phil Mickelson down there at one under as well. And Sandy Lyle, 60 years old, won the Masters, won the Open many, many years ago, still trying to do his best at the Scottish course. OK, uh, let's take um, a look at some of the other golfers as well. McElroy, um, of course, Rory McElroy, he goes out just before one o'clock. He played his first Open at Carnoustie, in fact. Look at his head cover there for his driver, the dog. St Bernard the dog. Um, he's hoping to add to his four majors. 
He's had a good 2018, but he missed the cut at the US Open. Tiger Woods, now he starts just before 3.30, so a bit of a wait before we get to see him. Uh, last won a major over a decade ago. He has 14 to his name, though, and this course will suit his game. You don't have to be a big hitter, and with his bad back, he's not quite as big as he used to be, but you don't have to be a big hitter to win here. You have to be good at the short game. Now, Ash Turner tees off at Carnoustie, having overcome a rare form of cerebral palsy when he was a kid. He actually fell into a fish tank, I understand, injured his head. Now, he took off golf, his parents wanted him to do this, to help with his balance, his recovery. And just a few weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, he qualified for the Open, an amazing...